Good morning. I'd like to open the meeting of the FAMA Select Board. It is April 1st, 2023 at 9 o'clock. And I will just remind the board and the public that this is a workshop meeting and there will be no public comment. So we will begin our business with policy discussions and we will start with the embarkation fund usage. And I'll turn that over to Mr. Johnson Stoff. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the embarkation fund is a fund uh, established under a special act of the legislature and it provides a revenue source for port towns that, um, that host uh, certain ferry services including the Steamship Authority. Uh, under that act, there, uh, we are required to treat the fee revenue that is received as a special revenue, so which means simply that it's it's earmarked and tracked separately from the rest of the general fund, and along with that special act, there are limited purposes for which the funds can be used, and I will just read to you a section of the act, which describes what those allowed uses are. Monies deposited may be appropriated for services, including but not limited to providing harbor services, public safety protection emergency services or infrastructure improvements within and around the harbor of any city or town which receives money from this section. End quote. So from the inception uh, back in 2004, when we, I believe that's the year we, the town first started collecting this revenue, the town has complied with this requirement by depositing the funds into a dedicated account and appropriating out of that fund it has actually been a stable, a fixed amount of money since that time, $350,500 um, by town meeting vote, and that, those funds have been allocated to the police and fire department specifically, and you'll see that in the town meeting warrant book. Um, after the, the budget line items is a summary of revenue sources, and in that summary there is a line item for the embarkation fund stating that it is allocated for police and fire, and that is uh, how, the, how the town has treated those funds and earmarked them for that purpose. So the, the board asked for this discussion, I believe in response to a request from the Transportation Management Committee, um, which goes back some time now, which recommended adopting a policy for the embarkation fund use. Uh, there is, I've provided to the board in your packet, <coughs> the policy that was drafted by the Transportation Management Committee, uh, which calls for um, reporting, uh, some reporting procedures, um, and some policy on future use of those funds. Uh, and <coughs> respectfully, I, I don't support that recommendation. I don't believe that we need a policy on the use of this fund. Uh, we have nine other similar funds uh, that we annually allocate from and fundamentally you know I, I don't see the need for two reasons one the tracking is in place the compliance is fine um, the inspector general was asked to look at it they didn't uh, they didn't have any findings that indicated that we were doing anything wrong we did uh, at the request provided a response uh, this is going back some time now under prior prior management um, but that response was provided to the inspector general and they have stated to us that they're not looking any further into this matter. Um, there, there is a, you know, a, there is some revenue in this account. So above and beyond the amount that we've been allocating each year, the 350,000, the fund has accumulated approximately $1.3 million as of this time. Now, after this upcoming town meeting, we're gonna pull 350 out of that, so it'll go down to a million. So, you know, we can certainly have a discussion about what is the best use of that money. And um, the Finance Committee has already talked about that might be a source to help us uh, fully fund <coughs> the gap. Should the override for the new firefighters be approved, as we've discussed, the override covers a portion of the 1.5 million, 950,000 of the 1.5 million. So an increase to the allocation from the embarkation fund for the fire department is one potential use of that excess funding that we have in there. Now, it wouldn't be you know, $500,000 because that would only, you know, we would only have two years of that money. 
but a small increase could be relied upon for a longer period of time. So that's just one option, and it could be combined with, um, with some of the other ideas that the Transportation Management Committee brought forward, which is to say, do we want to use those funds for complete streets? Um, and that's certainly an option. We could use some of those funds for design for complete streets. We could use some of those funds for traffic safety improvements. Um, there, you know, there have been some requests for, for additional um, smart signs that flash the speed limit. So there's a capital cost to that. There's also um, the DPW director, Peter McConaughey, has pointed out that he needs an increase in his budget to maintain those signs because we've been steadily adding the number that we have. That was one of the requests he put in for budget priorities that I was not able to fund. So that, again, could be a piece that we use that fund for. So I think the primary purpose of today's meeting and discussion was to talk about whether or not we want to have a policy, and if we do want to have a policy, what that policy might look, look like. And again, in, in summary, my suggestion is that we not adopt a policy and we you know, plan for as we have future discussions about capital priorities and operating budget priorities that we can have policy discussions, you know, we can discuss what's the best use of, of the balance in that fund. Thank you. Well, Mr. Brown? I'm going to comment that um, this wasn't really just because of the Transportation Committee. As you know, there was a complaint made by a member of the committee that we were inappropriately using the funds. Then the Inspector General made a determination that there wasn't sufficient indications on his plate that indicated that he needed to take action, and he was going to decline to take action. But he also indicated that, in his opinion, it would be very wise for the select board to take up a policy because there are certain statutes indicated that we should identify in a policy how we are complying with those and also where we are tracking what mitigation there is in the transportation corridor that serves the, the ferry. So there was definitely feedback. I got a phone call from the guy at the Inspector General's office because I was chair at the time. And I said, well, you know, it's, it seems odd that you would just give me this response in a phone call, and I'd like it in writing. He said, I'm not going to put it in writing. He says, you can relate this to your board, that this is my advice to you, that I would recommend you create a policy in a timely fashion, because it seems appropriate, in his opinion. So now that the fund is going to potentially triple with the new fee rate, I think it's even more important to have a policy. And the policy could be that we're appropriately funding public safety, or maybe we'd increase it. But I think it's somewhere in the policy it should say that we're going to reserve a certain portion, whatever it is, to do improvements along the corridor. Things like traffic counting, uh, you know, trash, compli trash truck <coughs> compliance, having an officer that's available to monitor if septic trucks are leaking, like we got an email that was just yesterday. So there's a lot of things that are kind of not being paid attention to, maybe, in this corridor. So I think there should be some language. And I don't think we're going to come up with it today, but I think we should at least consider that we need a policy. Doug, who was that you talked to? I was just trying to look up his, his name, but I'll find it. And I'll report it. I reported it at the select board meeting, so it's on a record as what the name of the person was, because I did it in my selectmen's reports at the end of the meeting during that week. Uh, yeah, we do have an email record of the name of that person. This is the first, um, I apologize, this is the first that I heard that the Inspector General had actually suggested that a policy was needed. Right. Um, I, I had only heard the feedback that they, there was going to be no formal response from the Inspector General. Right. Do Could other towns have their own local policies on embarkation fees? Do you know? So I have partial information on that. The, um, I spoke to the town manager in Nantucket yesterday. They do not have a formal policy. They have a, a separate article every year where they appropriate money for um, parking enforcement. Um, and that's basically how they use the whole thing, but no formal policy. Uh, the town of Yarmouth similarly does not have a formal policy. They allocate funds for um, for public safety, primarily in their case for Harbor Master, because they don't, you know, they have a traffic impact from the, the steamship <coughs> port in Hyannis, but they don't have a direct port. They share the harbor. Um, so that impact of the ferry in Lewis Bay is the reason that they have a portion that they get an allocation. Um, so they're treating it sim very similarly to, uh, 
technology. Is that where you got your your intel on why? Could you explain to me again why you think we don't need a policy? Because that was kind of a long explanation. What is the specifics behind the fact that you think we don't need one? Well, I just don't think that. Yeah, I mean, the specifics were up until this morning. You know, there was no indication from the IG that we needed a policy. That we have a lot of available funds that have statutory restrictions that we don't have a policy for, um, and that we're fully compliant is, you know, with the policy. Now, you know, these questions of what's the best use of the money, you know, who would that be left up to? Is that your discretion? <clears throat> it's, you know, it's part of the budget policy. So it's, you know, there's very public, you know, there's Absolutely. transparency and, yes, and there's dialogue about how we allocate revenues. You know, just as there is with local receipts, mm -hmm. which don't have any statutory requirement. Um, you know, we don't have a policy on the use of um, on the use of the debt stabilization fund, for example. Um, it's a restricted fund; we can only use it for debt, um, but we don't have a policy for it. Similarly, for for capital stabilization. Um, so that doesn't mean we couldn't in the future. Yeah, right. Here's the name: Philip Malenta. Man Spell that to Mantilla. Philip, M-A-N-T-Y-L-A. -A. That's a clarifying question. I forgot that it was the IG. I was trying to look up the state ethics. Yes. Inspector Ms. Scott Press? <coughs> so we're talking about the corridor. My assumption is that we're talking about Woods Hole Road. My understanding is that's a state road. So what, and this may be a question that's beyond the scope right now, but what authority do we have to do some of the things that we're discussing on a state road that we don't own? So for example, putting up lights Flashing lights, maybe there's a section of road that we can put that up. But as far as monitoring along the road, what what can we actually implement on that? So that's a good question. The you know we're not limited to the one road. You know there I would I would say that there certainly there are impacts that go beyond that road. Um, and but it, you know in terms of enforcement, the police department has authority to enforce traffic on every road, even state highways. Um, so, yeah, and then I, I guess that's, that's pretty much it. You know, we could do transportation enhancements that relate to the whole Woods Hole area that's impacted. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. you know, um, parking lots on Palmer Ave. So, you know, there's, and also the Island Queen and the Pied Piper are covered by the embarkation fee. So the downtown area is also applicable. I didn't consider those. I, I think I was thinking more specifically about, there's been some suggestions about very specific things to do on Woods Hole Road that my understanding was we didn't, we couldn't do, but. Well, we can actually request action from the, from the state mm -hmm. and we can collaborate with them, just like we did on the uh, crosswalk at Goodwill Park. Mr. Patterson. Yeah, I, you know, I, I just want to make sure that as far as traffic impacts, I mean, it seems to me that the huge commuting population that comes on to Cape Cod, now they estimate to be half of the people that work on Cape Cod come across the bridge. <coughs> but that coming into town in the morning, you know, between 8 and, and 9.30 is horrendous. And that's not traffic from the ferry. Mm -hmm. That's traffic from our economy here and the services that we would, would like to have for ourselves. So it seems to me that, you know, that particular corridor isn't just, isn't Probably it's a small fraction relative, it's not a majority of the fraction of the traffic on that road. Uh, so, but, but that's not to say that I don't think there's worth, it's worthwhile, as the Transportation Committee is kind of recommending, that we have a policy on how we allocate these funds. Because I've always felt that it was, yeah, I know the state allows us to put it into these general revenue kind of categories. But it would be nice to be able to say that we're focusing or, or we put a priority on this particular needs uh, in that particular transportation car, just because there's going to be that periodic impact. I think we've all experienced it. When the ferry comes in and you get this big slug of traffic that lasts for about 30 minutes, and you know that, that's an impact. But how much of that money should be focused on just that particular need? Uh, I think we need a dialogue to figure that out. I think that I hope that we can vote that we need a policy today, not really craft it completely, but just generally broadly discuss what it might be, like a certain percentage for public safety that's already been, you know, dependent, you know, the, it's, the budget is dependent on that revenue 
and as you pointed out in your preliminary message, we shouldn't be yanking revenue from uh, any department that they've been relying on unless there's a really good reason. But now, again, there's going to be a lot more revenue, so it's a bigger thing to be considering. Yeah. I think fire and rescue needs to be in there too mm -hmm. because we, we have we have to basically respond to anything that happens there at those terminals and, and that including health issues probably more frequently because the general case anyway than fire issues. But um, you know, we we are there <coughs> we're the people they call whenever they have an issue that they need support. I, I guess my thought is I'm I'm still not seeing or hearing a reason to actually have a policy if we can have discussions on how this money is spent. That's my first comment. My second comment is why the, why the savings in this account? Like why isn't it spent on things that we need to do each year? So that would, that's my only other question. And maybe you can't answer that because, yeah, because so the, other, uh, the previous administration saved the money, but, but I'm asking why. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the answer would be just it's part of the general pattern of fiscal conservatism, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it can go too far. And, you know, I certainly think, again, we've reached a point where it is a, it's very appropriate to have a conversation about what do we want to do with the million dollars that's in that account. Um, you know, I, I'm happy to craft a policy if that's the will of the board. Um, I, I would... Again, I just, I, I do feel like it is, there's this sort of tension between, on the one hand, you want to be mindful and deliberate and strategic about, uh, about long-term fiscal planning and budget planning, and on the other hand, you want to leave yourself flexibility. Who's you? Us collectively? The, the town. The town. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, yes. Mm -hmm. Finance. Yeah. Right. Right. I just wanted to identify who yeah. you yeah. was. Pronouns are, or wishy. wishy. Yeah. So, so the board in setting policy, that you know, the tension is between being deliberate and having a plan and allowing flexibility so that um, you can adjust as, as circumstances change. Um, and certainly, you know, if we were gonna set a policy that talks about allocation of the revenue, um, I would suggest that we assume there is no tripling of the embarkation fund fee until there is, right. you know, we can we can change that policy if it becomes a reality. Today, it's not a reality, and I hope it does become a reality. That'd be a great windfall for the town. Um, and but it's a very different conversation than where we are now. That's it. Um, I found myself agreeing with uh, Mr. Brown on this. Uh, a policy at least sets us up to stay in the lane, at least to, to serve as having that conversation at a certain trigger point and how much money spent. If we have a policy that it goes to a certain point that triggers that, it leaves it out of the sole responsibility of someone else what to do with the money without us being aware of it. Now that we've been categorized as you, as we, I think that there should be a spot in the game where in, it stops being ambiguous on how the money gets spent and we find out after the fact. I think that something should trigger as a policy to bring it to our attention, at least to have that discussion you're describing. If you'll excuse me for three minutes, I can go turn my lights off. I don't, I, I don't think you need a policy to do that. Um, and I would support the, um, the uh, acting town manager's recommendation. Well, I think that we had a pretty good example uh, a year and a half ago when uh, many citizens were wondering what they could do along Woods Hole Road for mitigation and it wasn't clear how to access the embarkation fund. So, I mean, it seems obvious to me that there is a need for a policy which dedicates, even if it's not a percentage, dedicates what type of actions or items might be included in funding requests from the fund. Because, and it was a dead end, when some transportation committee uh, suggestions were that maybe that money should be used for the Catherine Lee Bates crossing, other people wanted to put up the speed signs, which still haven't been done. I mean, it's quite a long time ago. So I think there is a roadblock to actually accessing the funds because the policy is not in place. But is the, is the roadblock because there is a policy in place? Or is there another roadblock? Or was there another roadblock? I think I'm the just lack of a policy was the roadblock, in my okay. opinion. Uh, 
I mean, I disagree. So yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to be argumentative about the mm -hmm. policy per se, because you know, I'm, you know, I've, I've stated the reasoning and happy to create a policy <coughs> if that's the will of the board. Um, but I, I do want to push back a little bit on the notion of that we need a, um, a clear process for a committee to access funds, right? So the way the, the financial management of the town works is the town manager prepares operating budget and capital budget, and there's, you know, and there's engagement and dialogue on both of those processes, and there's a finance committee review of that process. And we have policy discussions and strategic planning that feed those processes. So, you know, we don't have a, you know, again, we don't have a, um, you know, a, a process for how, you know, the, I'm trying to think of just another example. Um, you know, the, the Waterways Committee. How does the Waterways Committee access funds? You know, it, it fits in that same sort of what's the structure of the town and how do we make how do we make financial decisions? So, um, you know, the tra Transportation Management Committee is an advisory committee, like many other committees, and there may well have been flawed communication between the Transportation Management Committee and administration and the select board, and, you know, and let's talk about that. Let's talk about, you know, when is the right time to have these policy discussions and what's the best way for the town manager to get, um, to have community engagement, including the Transportation Management Committee, and board direction in terms of, you know, is it a priority to, to do smart streets? Is it a priority to do these traffic mitigation measures? Um, I don't think, I don't think you need a policy for that. I think you need good communication between the town manager and the select board. And, and what triggers that though? At what point does it stop being your decision or the town manager's decision and then it comes to the board? Who makes that determination if there is no, just whenever you... So, so there's, there's dialogue between the, you know, the Transportation Management Committee and staff and the select board and a proposal is brought forth that, hey, you know, we need to make it a priority to do smart streets. And we have a discussion with the board, okay, you know, how important is this? You know, we're doing our capital plan now, and what do we want to allocate to smart streets in our capital plan? And, and then town meeting weighs in, and they can change the budget on the floor, and have done. In many cases, they've said, you know, this is a priority in this town that you're overlooking. And I move this amount of money from certified free cash to here, there has to be a source, and there has to be a line item that it goes into, but that's one of the ways that the budget gets finalized, if you will, and meets specific needs within the town. But it wouldn't be the first time the horse got out of the barn before we found out about some things financially. It's always going to be the case. Well, we're trying to eliminate those cases is what, what I'm trying to get to, and that's why I tend to agree with Doug that if we stay in the lane, at least rudimentarily, it kind of gives us a little more control, or at least a timeline on when these things are going to happen. That's all I'm looking for. It's more right. transparency. Yeah. I just I re I'll refer us, you know, to our strategic plan and our long range plan. When people come before us, they make a point of they want to get something done, and a lot of times they refer to these long range plans or these strategic plans, and they say, "We've identified this. It's something we know that we need to deal with, and here's what our request is and how it fits in with that." So when they come to us and say, "We'd like traffic mitigation along Woods Hole Road." This is how it fits in with your policy. It, it reinforces their position, and mm -hmm. I think that it's helpful. And yep. I think that the what I've considered was a warning from the Inspector General's office that we should craft a policy in a timely fashion a year ago is a pretty good indicator that we probably should have a policy too. And again, that's the first time here. I'm sorry that, but you know, I did announce it at the meeting. I don't know if maybe you weren't with us that evening, and I told Mr. Suso by uh, in person or by phone. I'm not sure. It's been a year. I told him right away of the need for policy in the uh, Inspector General's office. And it was really weird that they didn't want to put it in writing. He said, I'm not going to put it in writing. He said, it's a sensitive subject, but I'm advising you to take action. Would that request be in a minute some way? Would you be able to rally on that to find out when that happens? I don't know See if it's in a minute, happens. but it's on the film. Yeah, right. Yeah. It doesn't sit well that they'll make a strong recommendation and not put in writing. Right. For me, I'm just—I'm I'm not doubting anything. I'm just saying that 
if the IG had a very strong recommendation, it's hard for me that they would not be willing to put it in writing because one of the things you think about is if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. Right. So I'm just, I think that's. I got puts the sense that he was trying position. to give us a reprieve rather than putting something in writing. Yeah, it just doesn't. I, well, I thought it was a, weird too. It is weird. If there's a clear regulation, they would have stated it. Yeah. Right. I mean, so it's just one of those gray areas, right? Yes. Yeah. And that's what we're really talking about here yes. and why we perhaps should consider a policy to kind of get rid of at least some of the gray, but not lock ourselves into the fact that yeah. this is the need that's going to top every other need in town. No, no. And that's in any a given, in any, in no. any given, in any given budget cycle, we might want to have some flexibility to move that revenue somewhere else because this town is not simple. Well, I, I wouldn't suggest that we say, 26% is going to be for this and 17% is going to be for that, but just identify what some of the uses might be and just leave it at that. And then, I but mean, you know, people are going to proof text that. Right. Well, it can say, be that's broad, where it should be. That's yeah. where it should be. It can be a broad policy, like many of our policies are, but I think it should be something. And I apologize, Doug. You, if you said it at a public meeting, I don't recall. I did refresh my memory with the email where you relayed to us that you had had this conversation with the Attorney General, and I didn't see that in the email. But you may well have said it, and I, I, but I don't remember. Okay. I think it's also important to recognize that, well, the, that, that uh, the issues that are being raised are part of this community deliberation about where priorities should be placed in any given budget year. Mm -hmm. And that's important, that we're listening to the public and responding appropriately and weighing what all the needs are and making sure that it's not overlooked. And I respect the, the Transportation Management Committee for keeping us a, aware of this particular issue in town. Mm -hmm. Well, can I move that we ask Mr. Johnson's dog to take a shot at crafting a policy that would be broad and flexible, yet identify certain, maybe the way the fund would be accessed, give some parameters for what people might expect when they're trying to get some street signs along Woodsville Road or a crosswalk or if any of that, you know. So, I guess I, I, I mean, we can certainly table it. I know there are a number of other issues on our agenda. Um, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't have, I've stated my, you know, my overall view mm -hmm. um, and happy to craft a policy that says, you know, here's how the revenue are going to be treated, here are potential uses. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to, to talk about how the funds are going to be accessed. Um, because again, you know, we have a, a charter and a structure for how spending plans are made and those decisions are made. And this falls under that same umbrella. I, don't, I really don't think we need a, a policy that says how you access. I mean, who's, who's accessing these funds other than the select board and the town manager through you know, the normal community engagement process and the strategic planning process. And town meeting. And, and, and with final approval by town meeting, right. But I've heard a motion. And I'll second it. I've got a motion and a second. Any more discussion amongst the board? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, no. No. Okay. But may I suggest that that policy include a paragraph that kind of defines the ambiguity of how the needs need to be addressed over a wide area. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I, I just remember driving down Woods Hole Road one day and somebody with a car carrier was coming out of Woods Hole. He was on his cell phone and he literally swerved across the, the median line and I had to go off of the road in order to keep from being hit by a truck with a car on the back. This is the kind of freight traffic that you see in and out. So it seems to me that law enforcement of that section of town because of the additional traffic clearly has to be a priority. And even so. if we don't currently have the staff to, to facilitate it, it should be identified that enhanced public safety in that area or some sort of monitoring of conditions and, and safety, I don't know what the wording would be, but something could be done to improve our handle on that. We are, all right, so we have a, a vote. We're going to move on to our fiscal policy update. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the, this topic was placed on the agenda to address a discrete issue, not a review of the entire 
uh, fiscal policy, and that issue is how are we going to treat room excise taxes. Uh, the board has had several discussions on that, um, and most recently, the board agreed to language that is in the FY24 operating budget policy, um, but that was, th there was a discussion of putting similar language in the fiscal policy and just to um, distinguish the two. So each year there's a, an annual budget policy and then there is an overarching fiscal policy which is intended to be you know, a long-term policy that doesn't get um, that doesn't change radically from one year to the next and is only, you know, periodically updated. Um, so this, this issue arose with two changes to the rooms excise tax. So the rooms excise tax includes, you know, for many, many years was just applied to hotels and motels. And then if, several years ago, it was broadened to include short-term rentals. And that increased the amount of revenue that the town brought in through the rooms excise tax. Uh, so that's one change that happened. And then there were actually, over, you know, looking back just three or four years, the, the base rate of the room excise tax was changed twice. So the town was assessing a 4% room excise tax uh, going back five years ago. It was raised to 4%, and then a couple years later, uh, sorry, it was raised from 4% to 5%. And then uh, a couple of years later, it was raised to 6%. And that last increase is effective July 1 of 22, which is this current fiscal year. So there was, um, there, the board has had a number of discussions of how do we want to allocate that money. And for, and I'm not going to go back through all of the history of those several conversations because there were you know, some different conclusions at different times. But the most recent agreement was that we would take a million dollars of new revenue that was generally attributed to the sh addition of short-term rentals and split that evenly between affordable housing and schools. So 500,000 for schools, 500,000 for affordable housing. And with the most recent increase in the base rate from 5% to 6%, that was explicitly, it, it was initiated by the Affordable Housing Committee and it was approved at town meeting with a written explanation that said that additional revenue was going to go to affordable housing. So for this, in the policy for this um, coming fiscal year, FY24, the operating budget policy said that $350,000 will be allocated to the Falmouth Affordable Housing Fund and a million will be allocated to the, uh, the Falmouth Housing Afford Falmouth Affordable Housing Fund and School Department operating budget each receiving $500,000. Um, so that's, that's what we have in place for this year. My proposal in terms of a long range fiscal plan is essentially to use that as a baseline and allow yourselves flexibility going forward. Um, so that I've, I've drafted language um, that's in your packet. It's not the fiscal policy, but I didn't see anything highlighted as a change. On page two, there's two things that are underlined. I assume those are the changes. Me too, under, uh, uh, yeah, it's at the top yes. of page two. Oh, under, the underlined. Okay. Under yes. I, the, yeah, the highlighted. So the language that I've proposed, I'll read it. Town manager's proposed budget shall allocate to affordable housing the greater of one-sixth of estimated rooms excise tax revenue consistent with the explanation provided to town meeting for Article 15 of November town meeting of 2021 or $850,000. So you'll notice I didn't say anything about the school allocation there and my thinking is that the, you know, the way we generally treat the school department budget like all other department budgets is the, the current budget is the baseline, and we allow a certain percent, typically 2.3% increase from one year to the next. That's, you know, there are exceptions that are made, of course, um, in, in both directions, usually more on the upside rather than the downside. Um, but I, I don't know that it's necessary 
to codify that in a policy, the fact that we put $500,000 in the FY24 base budget for the school department. Okay, so you just said it. So that 500000 is just figured as the base. Right. Every year. Right. Recurring. Okay, right. thank you. I was just and, and not to say that, you know, we would, I certainly would not plan to strip that out of the base in FY25 for no reason, um, but at the same time, you know, if there's some big change, like if there's a huge spike in, um, in state aid for education, uh, and in dialogue with the superintendent, it appears that they don't need as much town money because of the increased state aid number, there wouldn't be anything in the policy that would prevent an adjustment to the base. Thank you. I think it's a questions reasonable addition. Any questions, comments? Any motions? I would move to approve this adjustment to the fiscal policy. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. <coughs> Any more discussion amongst the board? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Short term rental regulations. So we're putting this together. It's a nice overview. Yeah, I'm excited to get this conversation started. It's a, uh, a complicated and potentially very important issue um, with a lot of consequences of inaction and a lot of consequences if any actions are taken. So it's um, not, um, you know, in my view, uh, any action that the board takes needs to be really deliberate and well thought out. Um, and our presentation today is intended to be an introduction to the, the regulatory landscape, um, a little bit of uh, information about what some other towns are doing, and the beginning of a conversation in terms of what action we, we may want to take. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm just going to uh, extrapolate on that just a little bit. So what we are providing, yes. Don't forget Our, to tell people who you are. Thank hello, you. my name just is Mark O'Keefe, <laughs> Town Council. Thank you for having us. Yeah, CTV, all in Spain, I recognize you. And I have with me Jed Cornack, who's the Town Planner, and Brian Tobin, who is the Associate Town Council. Um, so today, we're going to provide you with information building blocks that you can use to create policy about where you want the town to go as far as short-term rentals go. Um, this uh, presentation is going to give you an overview of what the law looks like now in Falmouth and what, um, what the law permits, where it can go, and then, uh, so we're going to do like a brief zoning overview of what short-term rentals actually look like in the town. And then we're going to go over what other communities do right now to regulate. Um, there are a lot of possibilities for where the board can go with this, it, but it all depends on what your vision is for short-term rentals and what the impact of the regulation is going to be. Where do you want the town to go? Um, so to that end, here's what we're gonna do. Introduction, check, we already did that. So potential goals, um, we're gonna, Jed's gonna talk about the zoning bylaw review. Um, Brian's gonna talk about drafting strategies. So when we get to a point where you make a decision about what, how you wanna regulate this, Brian's going to talk about what that actually looks like. And he's also going to show you um, real world examples. We have a survey of six communities that we did that might provide you with some good information about where you want to go. And then we'll take some questions. So, Jed. Thank you. Um, and for the record, Jed Cornock, town planner. Uh, so, as you can see up on the screen, uh, what we try to do is um, articulate why you're here today and why the discussion um, is happening. Um, I don't need to repeat it, but you all know Fal uh, Falmouth is a lovely place to live, but also to vacation. Uh, that summer uh, tourist attraction is real, and in the summer months, uh, you know, the population sort of explodes uh, in town. And so a lot of those folks uh, are likely staying in short-term rentals. And so initial conversations with the building department who was looking at some outside vendors who manage um, short-term rentals expect or project around 3,000 to 4,000 
uh, units uh, within the calendar year. So there's quite a lot of demand, if you will, or even supply, if you, if you consider it. But part of this discussion today is also balancing that private property right, right? Someone who owns a, 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 a short-term rental and wants to be able to rent it out to someone who's uh, coming into town for the summer, but balancing that impact with the quality of life of the neighborhood and also the impact to the housing stock. So what we did is we drafted some potential goals. These are draft. Um, I want to emphasize that. They're, they're really just uh, conversation starters for today and as you move forward. So I won't read them all, but you know I, I touched upon it a little bit just a, a moment ago, the whole idea of preserving that year-round housing stock. Uh, that's a, a, a big factor, but also the quality of life of the neighborhood and the impacts, balancing that impact with a, with a short-term rental. Um, and then as you can see, there, there's options for other uh, potential goals. So again, not anything set in stone, but sort of to guide the conversation for today. So where are they? Um, I want to just articulate what's on this slide. So uh, in preparation for this presentation, uh, I went on to Airbnb uh, on St. Patrick's Day, at the end of the workday, of course, and um, <laughs> looked for potential properties in two periods of time over the summertime. So 4th of July week, uh, so if my family and I are going to be coming down to Falmouth to stay for an entire week, there were 113 properties on the left-hand side of the screen, and you can see the distribution along the west and along the southern coast. Also, road race weekend, uh, that's a mouthful, uh, for just staying the weekend. Again, similar number of properties, one date for the search, one uh, platform, airbnb.com. And again, Your numbers on a per night basis? Uh, yes, yep. Can I just comment briefly, one second? Sure. So it's an interesting snapshot, but bear in mind that these things are usually booked months in advance. Absolutely. And especially for these two weekends. So what you're seeing as available is like bottom of the barrel. Exactly. And so if you went on there December 1st and looked at what's available next year, that map would be flooded. Right. So right. it's very different. And, and you stole the thunder of the of very next uh, comment. Sorry. Was, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it obviously fluctuates. I went on this morning and checked these these um, exact dates. The numbers are completely different. So it's up and down all over the place. And you're absolutely right. Okay, thank you. Sorry for butting in. No problem. So the next three slides cover the zoning bylaw review. So it's essentially what does the zoning bylaw can uh, include as of today. Uh, there's no express reference to short-term rentals, and in, uh, in fact, the term itself is not articulated in the zoning bylaw. The closest allowable use, as you see on the screen, is what's called commercial accommodations. So that's section 249.4. For those of you who love the zoning bylaw like I do, um, you can go home this afternoon and, and read that section. The definition is broad, uh, and I'll go over that in the next slide, and the bylaw itself is very general. Um, but as you can see, the dimensional requirements, such as lot coverage, building height, setbacks, those are the types of things that would control commercial accommodations, but also parking. Parking is really uh, one of those limiting factors. It's all allowed by special permit within the majority of the zoning districts, and I'll get to that um, specifics in just a, a minute or two. So overall, what we've done is we sort of scrubbed this idea of commercial accommodations in town. What we know is that there's approximately 35 establishments. They are inns, motels, hotels, um, uh, boarding houses, lodging houses, etc. So the definition, as you can see up on the screen here, includes, and I'll just read it for the record, premises for rental to transient guests, including a boarding, lodging, or tourist home, motel, hotel, or inn. Uh, bed and breakfasts are always uh, also included in that. I'm not going to read the definitions uh, below that, but you get the sense for how broad that definition and the things that could be included. Last slide for zoning. As I mentioned, um, they are allowed by special permit in all of our uh, zoning districts with the exception of two. They're not mentioned in Marine and or Senior Care Retirement District. They're also not allowed in the Light Industrial B and Light Industrial C, as you can see here on the screen, denoted in N. And just so everyone is aware of what these mean, so the top row here is uh, agricultural districts, the second row is your business district, Light Industrials after that, public use, and then single residence. 
So as you can see, everything is allowed by special permit through the Zoning Board of Appeals. With that, I will pass the baton to Brian. Good morning, Brian Tobin, Associate Town Council for Town of Helmand. So Jed is, uh, unpacked big picture regarding the town and some of its uh, specific needs and then narrowly focused in on what we could potentially do either in applying the regulatory framework through the zoning bylaw. I'm gonna step back a little bit from a uh, draft uh, and look at things from a drafting perspective. Uh, what that does is that also includes potentially our current <coughs> general you. bylaw, bless you, pardon Thank you. <laughs> our current general bylaw, uh, which does allow for or require uh, with general rentals, Board of Health rental registration or registration, I should say, with the Board of Health. Now, the reason that why this is possible is because of case law out there. So the Styler case basically stands for the proposition that if a town so chooses, it can enforce its rental regulations over short-term rentals. So it's not that we're necessarily already operating in a vacuum, it's just that we don't have specific regulations on the books. Why that's important is there is an increasing trend among towns to adopt specific regulations for short-term rentals. It's generally acknowledged uh, both in, uh, you know, kind of from a practical boots on the ground administrative perspective, as well as by the courts, that there is there are material differences between short-term rentals and long-term rentals, and the impact it has on it, on a community, both from a public health and safety standpoint, as well as from a general housing market standpoint. Um, so, uh, stepping back. Uh, we have a number of tools in our kit to look at. We can do it through a general bylaw. We can do it through some community. What some communities have done is uh, zoning bylaws that are specific to short-term rentals. That's a little bit more of a rare approach, but it is a possibility. Or we could do it exclusively through Board of Health rules and regulations. So what does that look like from a drafting perspective? The very first, most crucial, and most important thing we need to do is determine what our goals are. What is it that the town wants to do with short-term rentals? Jed uh, listed a number of goals. A couple of themes that we saw in our six-town survey were managing the impact on the housing market, right? Some towns in particular on the Cape are very concerned with workforce housing. So that's something that the select board might consider. Uh, also capturing additional tax revenue. How does that come into play? Not from, you know, Peter had alluded to the tax increases, right? So that's uh, a purely quantitative number uh, it can however increase with an increase in registration so if you're not actively enforcing short-term rentals there's a lot of uh, rental units out there that aren't either reporting to the state registering with the state or registering with the town and therefore they're not paying taxes so after we determine our goals then we want to determine the structure and uh, substance would follow structure so structure would be you know are we going to do this as a general bylaw are we going to do this as a zoning bylaw are we going to do this purely as a board of health uh, rules and regulations, or are we somehow <coughs> going to combine the three, or two of the three? Um, substance would be kind of getting into more of the details. What is enforcement? Uh, wh what enforcement provisions are we going to put? Uh, are we going to uh, draft into the bylaws? You know, specifically, what do we want the regulations to look at? And then we would get into the enforcement policy. So a lot of towns have both official and unofficial enforcement policies. So there's the enforcement policy that's down on the books, right? You know, say a $100 fine for the first offense, you know, or increases in the registration fees if you don't register on your own. In other words, if you're uh, caught as an unregistered rental, then you would have a higher rental registration fee that would continue on. And then there's actually enforcing. And one of the common themes that came up in the towns that we looked at is the need for human capital from an enforcement perspective. How do we actually enforce things? because it is actually quite a bit of work. Oh, and one last point I wanna, before I move on to the next slide, really emphasize is uh, what we noticed with every community we looked at is that what was the ultimate driving force in how things were drafted and structured was a combination of the goals that they initially sent out, uh, set up on the front end and then the unique characteristics of the community. So those are the two things that we're gonna really need to consider. What do you want to accomplish and what does Falmouth look like? All right, so we looked at six towns. Four out of the six were in the Cape and Islands. We chose two that were off Cape that were somewhat comparable to Falmouth. <coughs> Lexington, for example, is off Cape. 
but it has uh, close to an identical population of Falmouth. Uh, it's approximately 30,000 people uh, full-time year-round. It does not, uh, it is uh, not similar to Falmouth in the sense that Falmouth expands to 100,000 people in the summertime, so it didn't share that characteristic, but a number of the other towns that we looked at obviously did, especially on the Cape and the Islands. Some themes we saw were that four out of six did require registration through the Board of Health. There were two outliers. Uh, one was Lexington. They have uh, registration with the zoning department, which uh, falls under the building commissioner's uh, program <coughs> in Lexington. Lexington is unique in that sense, and that the zoning administrator and the zoning enforcement officer are the same person, so they're all under building. Uh, and then Great Barrington. Great Barrington had everything underneath the select board and the select board's purview. One of the reasons for that, though, is their population is 3,000 people, and they don't have the same massive tourist influx that, say, a province town does, right? Province town is 3,500 people, but in the summertime, they go to 60,000, right? And during certain events, they're at 100,000. Everybody had inspection, right? Five out of six had inspection with the Board of Health or the Board of Health and other departments. Um, and then based on community needs, uh, there was some fluctuation. One, for example, uh, required self-inspection with an affidavit annually. So if you were then later reported and your affidavit didn't match your inspection, they would kind of red flag you and continue to look at you. From an enforcement perspective, five out of six required civil penalties, uh, primarily through GL Chapter 40, Section 21D, that allows you up to $300 per day per offense. Uh, some of the towns would stagger them. Again, start off $100 first offense, $200 second offense, $300 third, and so forth. With that, I'll turn things back to Moira. So what this breaks down to is you have several options going forward. You can just keep doing what we're doing, and we do regulate some of the existing short-term rentals out there through our general bylaw that requires a registration for rentals. We understand, though, that there are a lot of short-term rentals out there that simply aren't captured by what we're doing. So um, an, th another option might be to enforce the existing zoning bylaw, which, as Jed explained, um, would require that any kind of commercial rental entity out there be submitted to a special permit process. There are practical implications of that that the board wants to consider, especially if there are 5,000 short-term rentals out there that might need a special permit. Um, you can amend the zoning bylaw uh, to address that specifically. Uh, that would come into play if you want to um, relegate these short-term rentals into specific districts. That's how you would do that through the zoning bylaw. Otherwise, there's, there's the general bylaw and registration uh, avenue where we would be looking to our zoning administrators and, the, and our health department to create a registration and enforcement process. Um, and then the other route, just procedurally, you could just do this all through Board of Health regulations. But those are things to consider. But like Brian said, it all starts with you. It starts with where do you want to go? And so you have a lot to talk about, but we're here to help you shape however you want those goals, whatever you want those goals to look like into proper bylaws and regulations. Questions? I have a question. What if we wanted to, uh, you know, I, I understand it's a property right issue, and if a person owns a home, and they need that summer rental income. I don't want to prohibit an individual from renting their own property to better their own financial position because that's an important part of getting by on Cape Cod. A lot of people will take a vacation in the summer, rent their house. So I don't want to impact local residents that are just trying to supplement their income on a one house basis. I'm most concerned with what I saw when I went to visit and rented an Airbnb in Maryland was hundreds and hundreds on the same corporation. I don't know how that impacts their community, but I, I chose to rent from an individual. So I don't want to see that come to Falmouth when we're not even paying attention and, and it hits us like a freight train. I don't know if it's already <coughs> happening. I suspect there's some element of that. But when I look on, for instance, social media, and I see a company called Enphase showing how you can uh, maximize profit 
by letting them <coughs> manage your short-term rental properties. So they want to manage it for you and just turn it into a business source, business revenue. So that's very concerning to me. I wonder if, my question is, I wonder if there's a way to specifically allow residents or voters to maintain these rights going forward, but yet put a commercial accommodation restriction on corporate interests that may come here to exploit our housing stock. That's a great question, and I think Brian is prepared to talk to that. So the answer is so far, yes, there is, set by both statute and an attorney general's opinion. So section 14 of GL 64G um, allows a town to define who the operator can or cannot be. And the attorney general's office, uh, through the Great Barrington decision, because that's actually something that Great Barrington uh, chose to adopt, has said that an outright ban on corporations is okay and a restriction for limited liability com companies to require all of their members to be actual individual entities is also okay. So pursuant to the Attorney General's analysis, which included constitutional concerns, you know, restrictions on commerce, et cetera, that that is an acceptable approach. I like that. I'd be all for that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just comment that I, I, I hear what Mr. Brown is saying about letting individuals rent. Where I get concerned with that is people who have someone who, who lives here and works here and has their children in the schools here, but then kicks them out in May and then will let them come back in September. So I don't know if there's a way to manage that, but it just, it just feels wrong. I just don't know how people can do that to begin with, but it feels like there should be a way to manage that, that if you are allowing someone, like maybe short term is defined as something shorter than that, and then long term has to be defined as at least 12 months, or something where a family does not get put out for a couple months out of the year, but then they're, they're welcome back in, when we know that there's nowhere for them to go. I don't know how to, how to craft that language. But I think we're gonna have to just start with the simple stuff to at least get something in place, and then continue to work on it as we go along. I don't know how that would be done. I think I think you hit it though. I think it's the definition. The definition. That's how you sort of tie that up neatly. Is what is the definition of short versus long? And I think that would go back to linking that to what are our, our goals in developing this. And that would be one of the goals. Yeah. Maybe to make that happen. I'm just. Uh, and I follow up with another question from Mr. Tobin. Sure. Is that an action that you described? Was that an action that would be taken by this board, or is there another entity that would need to be engaged? Uh, to 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 uh, authorize the, the controls that you just mentioned that was used in Great Barrington. It may require a town meeting vote. It may need to be structured through a general bylaw and the adoption mm -hmm. of a general bylaw. Okay. Um, and it would its ultimate statutory authority though would be 64G section 14. Um, so yeah, what that section of the statute does is allow a town to adopt ordinances and regulations so, and it creates certain parameters within which they can specifically for the purposes of managing short term rentals. It sounds like a great model. Uh, I would, if I could, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we authorize the town manager to work with staff to develop that in preparation for town meeting and perhaps it would be brought back to the board for potential modification along the way prior to the closing of the warrant? Uh, I would just like to, to say that that's just one part of mm -hmm. the bylaw. Yeah. It's a minor part of the bylaw. We can't, we can't draft a bylaw until you do a significant policy development. That can be one aspect absolutely that we will look at, but there's more of a conversation that needs to take place among this group before we can draft anything. Okay. Um, you, some things that need to be discussed are, do you want to consider limiting um, short-term rentals to certain districts? Um, what's the purpose of regulating them at all? Um, we can work backwards if you give us broad policy brush strokes about why you're regulating them in the first place, then we can draft something. It's, it, we're not ready yet though because we just simply don't have enough information. That will be part of our draft, the, um, the corporate concern. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't we want to really, as a board, sort of identify our goals really well first? Mm -hmm. And then wouldn't we want to bring both the Board of Health and the building department into the conversation? I so, would, oh. I, I would add, uh, God commission. Because this is not a felon only problem. No, it isn't. 
Um, and in fact, it's not even a coastal problem where we have a tourist population that's part of our economy. Um, it's, you know, it's being faced, this problem is being faced up and down the East Coast. And, and all the resort areas. areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you that when I was growing up in Maryland, Ocean City have one whole environment and culture, if you will, and then you <laughs> go up to where you live in north of Baltimore, and it was entirely different. And when we came to Cape Cod, because it was so residential, we were just tickled to death. But, you know, you're talking about a, a city that, Ocean City, Maryland, I'm sure it's Ocean City, New Jersey, too, is basically a business operating in a community, you know, and so that, that dominates the whole culture of, of those communities. And I, I would think that we would want to work to try to minimize that and preserve that residential feel, which my family and I so cherished when we were raising our children. Ms. Scott Price, go ahead. I'm hoping that one of the things that we can be provided is uh, like a backwards timeline. So if we want to have something, I would like to see something on November's town meeting warrant about this, because I think we have to get on this immediately. So working backwards and reverse engineering of when do we need to have the bylaw completed to make sure that we vote on it to get on the warrant, and then before that, you know, how, how long do we want to have to have iterations back and forth? I think discussing with the Board of Health and the Building Department is going to be critical because if we want to enforce anything, we're likely going to need more staff. Then we also have to figure out how to pay for said staff. And maybe this is where embarkation fees would come in. I don't know if that's appropriate. But something like that, we'd have to figure out where that money's going to come from. So I think that'd be really helpful for us as we think about, I know we're not going to go through writing a policy today, but we're thinking big picture. So it'd be good to know what a timeline might be so that we can really think strategically about maybe having a whole, I think this is important enough to maybe have a whole other workshop. I know, Saturdays. No, Sorry, I agree. Guys. But I do think it's important for us to probably spend at least an hour, if not more, really discussing what this policy would look like to make sure that we're thinking about everything and that we know how we're going to enforce it. So that would just be really helpful as we plan. I'd like to see other policies from some of the other towns too, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. Agreed. I think we can take policies and see, you know, extract which pieces fit for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would be really helpful to do in a in a workshop, and it may be a whole day, folks. Not yet, and not in April. Not in April, <laughs> please. I promise, not April. Have a good time, guys. Sure. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Mr. Zelensky. I, I know that <clears throat> there have been other times where we've had little projects that the vice chair and yourself have, have deemed, you know, we come up with a handful, five or six individual points that we can canvas our constituency with and parts of the town that may be beneficial to coming back to that said workshop so we can help identify and outline it for you guys. Mm -hmm. So at least we have something to key off of going down the line so it's not, and I want to categorize it as willy-nilly because it certainly isn't. But we'll all have our key points so we're not overlapping. It can be reviewed so we're not touching the same ground twice. Mm -hmm. I think it would be more productive. Um, that's just an opinion. I would agree. I think that's a way to structure it. Um, I, again, I want to go back to what are our goals? And because we have to establish our goals, and then we have to come up with a plan to meet those goals, right? Yeah. And if you're saying November, then we do need to do backwards design to make sure that we can, if that's that's what the board wants, that we can make that happen. Yeah. I, I would Brown. say to begin with, the overarching goal would just be to prevent our housing stock from becoming a corporate source of income. Yeah. That's what it's yeah. becoming. And that would be part I of what agree. you identified, because yes. then they would weigh out what the liabilities are, what the property rights are, all of that, and then they can compartmentalize that, right? Am I right? You're right. Okay. And I don't think anyone... I'm very rarely told that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I, I think the board would agree that that would be like maybe number of our overarching goal. And then from there, where do we go? <clears throat> where do we go from here? Have we elicited enough I, I, goals I guess to begin? Or? So, uh, you know, we can either end it here. You've given us, you know, direction in terms of some next steps. Um, or if you want to spend, you know, a few minutes looking at these goals and just, um, you know, beginning that conversation of what your current thoughts are on these goals, that might be a productive use of another. And just to be clear, these are these are <coughs> just seeds of ideas. The, these are just a, a thoughts to get you going. Um, they're by no means an exhaustive list. Or, or are we saying that these should be your goals? 
but they're just something to get you thinking about where you want to be. I'd, I'd uh, like some time. I was going to say, I'm not sure we want to get into our goals yet. I think we have one overarching goal that Mr. Brown stated very clearly, and I think the board is, there's consensus among that. But I think I would like to schedule a Saturday workshop where we can really dive into this. And, and I like the C's because it, it gives us a place to jump from. Okay. Great list. Would you agree? Yeah. And, um, and some are divergent. You know. Yes. So <coughs> preserve the supply of year-round housing stock is, of course, top of the list. That makes sense. Fourth one down, preserve property, pro private property rights is kind of not what we're talking about. But Directly. at the same time, we have to keep that on the radar because we don't want to be. It may spill into that. We, yeah. we have to, from my perspective, we have to balance it a little bit. Exactly. We Absolutely. really have to hear it. We have to balance it, and then we go. We do have to go back to our where our goals are. We're going to have to right? have public forums where yes. people can come and tell us because there might be things that we're not thinking about. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I agree. And then there's the enforceability side. Yes. It's very complex. And um, the added cost, the budgetary yes. part of it, all of it. I mean, there's a lot to get into. And yeah. the tripping point <clears throat> is is if we can't enforce it, you know, then it's. Yeah. It's well, kind of all for nothing. It's I what think we those days now. are numbered on we can enforce. We've been saying that for, for years, and we have to get over that. We have to find a way to be able to say our rules and regulations will be enforced. But my, my point is, I think we need, need a different additional staff to do that and do it well. I think I agree. Because I think that our departments are, <coughs> are stressed as it is. So if, I'm just thinking if we move this forward and we come up with great goals, if we're going to... To spend the time with the goals, we've got to be able to enforce it, which means we've got to bulk up the departments. And we're going to have so to, to re-look at our allocation of the funds specifically from this, and maybe it's not just schools and affordable housing, maybe some of this is going to be attributed to the implementation of these regulations. So maybe we might have to take a small percentage and attribute it to staff that's going to address these issues. But you can't necessarily build on the plane while we fly. We got to get from <laughs> here to true. before yeah. you start addressing that. Yeah. I mean, that's just yeah. Yeah. just keep well, a parachute I handy. <laughs> yeah. I just if, if you believe in the plane, you don't need a parachute. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You're willing to ride it down. I don't think so. <laughs> that's right. Do I need the gavel here? I just want to reiterate. I think it's really important that as we think about our goals, that we really think about the people who want to live here year round and I mean I know a lot of people who are kicked out in the summer because their landlords make an egregious amount of money and don't care and they do it every single year. We, so We've had that a long time though. Yeah I know I'm just saying I want to make sure that we keep that at the forefront because <clears throat> I know a lot of people, multiple people who have left the Cape and are not going to come back because they're tired of moving and they can just live off Cape yeah. and we're seeing more and more people leave the Cape and not come back. And so that's why I think it's really important that we look at a timeline to get this on November town meeting warrant to at least do something. I agree with that. It, and I also think, that look at the some of the restaurants in town that are looking for private homes to put some of their workers in the summer. Yeah. Um, well, we can't really dictate that, but we can point no, out that there's a need. I'm simply saying, right, it just it just goes to the need. I'm not saying anything about regulating it or anything. I'm right. saying it, it just speaks to there's no place for them to go. And that could be so for Mr. Kasparian could have some input Absolutely. On too. Absolutely. We're going to need lots of discussion. So he, here's, here's the way I would like to move forward on this. I'm sorry, but you and I <laughs> potentially could work on sort of a backward design. Love it. Okay? And, and try to come up with a date for the next workshop. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So at least we could put some, together some kind of timeline, and we would have to do that with town council's office so that we're not making it crazy and certainly with, um, with Jed, just so we can work backwards and see if we can't put something together. With it. Yeah, and then, more. you'll believe me, you're all going to get assignments, Mr. Patterson. We're getting used to that. <laughs> hey, I'm planning to sign up for the Affordable Housing Committee, so I'm not leaving the game. Well, you're going to have an assignment before you go, so. Can I ask one more question before we close this? Yes. Uh, if we get bogged down and we find that we're not going to be prepared for November, for some reason unknown, is there such a thing as a potentially a temporary moratorium on these until we get some regulations in place? I don't know how that would be enforceable. <coughs> okay, we yeah. could certainly look at it, but um, part of the problem we're having right now is we don't have a handle on how to enforce what's existing, mm -hmm. and placing a moratorium on them requires 
some ability to have control in the first place. Right. Can I ask another one that's good? Is <coughs> I know that the Airbnb platform requires uh, renters to get a state tax ID and be filed and registered with the State Department of Revenue. Is it true that all of the platforms do that, or are some not doing that? I don't know, but we'll look into that. Well, I can give a partial answer to that question. It is part of the uh, the rooms tax regulation mm -hmm. that all owners of short-term rentals have to register with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Yes. But I wonder if the platforms are enforcing it. Like Craigslist, only thing Craigslist and. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's also an alternative uh, path that could enforce them not to be able to operate in town unless they are following certain guidelines <coughs> requiring registration. Just one more thing to throw out there, but I just... So I, I can provide a little bit more, um, I don't have a definitive answer to the specific question, but what I can tell you is that um, we do have some resources in terms of ensuring that, uh, that those who are renting are complying with the, with the excise tax. Uh, so one is um, that this, the state will provide us with a list of here are all the properties that have registered. And we, in the FY24 operating budget, I included an allocation of $60,000 to pay for a service that does a web crawl right. that will look at That's the right. Craigslist and the Airbnbs and the VRBOs and all other places to find out who's advertising short-term rentals so we can compare that against the state's list. Mm -hmm. um, and, just so, and, and that will give us a, a set of data for our own enforcement and regulation for whatever path that we choose. Mm -hmm. And at least it kept to the revenue right. until mm -hmm. such time as we do something. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Your welcome. Really informative. We appreciate look forward it. to putting this all together with, with you. Awesome. Okay, good. And at this point, I will, um, if there's nothing else for the, from the board, I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion amongst the board? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye.